Welcome back to the Kumeyaay channel, everybody. We are continuing our book review series of A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. So this next chapter, I said the previous chapters were my favorite. I think uh, the Great Depression chapter, in fact, take that back. I believe this is my favorite chapter and probably his best, most uh, impressive chapter. So you got the Carter, Reagan, Bush, bipartisan consensus, all these administrations crammed into one chapter. What a, uh, what a, what a very impressive feat. Um, so this bipartisan consensus, Zinn argues that the establishment or American political tradition remains the same, no matter which party is in control. The core values of private property, capitalistic enterprise, and the military industrial complex remain the same no matter if Democrats or Republicans are in charge of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. It's an extremely difficult chapter. If this is your first time reading this stuff, uh, I definitely would believe that uh, you probably struggled and probably didn't retain very much. Um, okay. So I would suggest reading it over again, taking good notes uh, so it goes into your core memory. So he starts out with Hofstetter. So Hofstetter has a book called uh, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. And that's one of my favorite books of all time. Um, there's also a book called American Political Tradition. He's probably one of the most important thinkers of in the last maybe 50 years. So if you haven't read Hofstetter, please read him. So he talks about, Hofstetter talks about, there's a quote, the range of vision of, in the major political parties has always been bound by the horizons of private, um, of, of, excuse me, have been bound by the horizons of property and enterprise. They have accepted the economic virtues of capitalistic culture. That culture has been intrinsically nationalistic and this kind of goes to the idea where you can't talk about communism or socialism because capitalism has become a national identity. Um, and so that's what's frustrating to me as an academic and as, an, as a free thinker is that we are censored by our culture, uh, the American culture, which is capitalistic. Um, and being Native American, I believe that uh, capitalism has many flaws and it's not necessarily always, uh, it's not really my identity. Um, so you're going to have to decide that for yourself. But if you're an American, the capitalistic identity is a national um, is a nationalistic, a very intensely nationalistic and culturally uh, tied to what it means to be American. This limited vision uh, encourages enormous fortunes, accepts a desperate poverty, nationalistic acceptance of war, and constant preparation for war, no matter what party is in charge. A recognition of this uh, voters. So what happens is, you know, I think a lot of people are aware of this stuff. So what they do is now they're apathetic to politics. So voters stay away from the polls without enthusiasm. You know, it's the same old saying, no matter who it is, I don't care. Uh, nothing's going to change type of um, mentality. So uh, what we're noticing from the 60s of 76, there's a drop in participation. So 63% voted in the 60s on the presidential election. By the time you get to 76, you get to 53%. And so I think we're lucky uh, before, obviously the last election was pretty uh, an anomaly, but before that you have maybe half the people voting for, for our president. And this disillusionment of poli in politics leads to entertainment, gossip. So politics now is just a show, it's a spectacle. And I think people accept it as such. Um, Activism, so activism now is kind of dead and gone. Uh, I think 2020 saw a, re, a resurgence of this 60s activism, um, but I would say in no way, shape or form is it really close to the 60s because it kind of died out after the summer. Um, activism, so um, okay, let me just read my notes. Yeah, so basically activism dropped. Poor black on black violence started to rise uh, poor poor uh, poor people that are black uh, so black on black violence were against other races so uh, races so this is the time of the rise of the of gangs in, in los angeles for example 
uh, the Crips and the Bloods. There were thousands, uh, tens of thousands of gangs um, starting at this time as a result of poverty. And we'll cover that later in a moment. So Carter's presidency goes from 77 to 80. And Carter, so this chapter obviously starts off with Carter. He remained within the boundaries of the American political tradition that Hofstetter states. He protected corporate wealth and power. He maintained huge military, the huge military machi machine that drained our coffers, allying with the right-wing tyrannies, in, um, especially in Latin America. So Carter gestured, uh, made a gesture towards helping blacks and poor and human rights. They always do, politicians always do, uh, to get elected. Claim, and he claimed he was this ordinary political, um, ordinary farmer, populist, sound familiar, uh, beleaguered by, uh, and beleaguered by the powerful and the wealthy. We hear this over and over and over again, although people tend to, they don't read apparently, so they think this is all new. Every time a new politician comes, they always promise um, that they're one of, the, one of the people and they're gonna drain the swamp and all that. And then here we are again, uh, nothing changes. They promised, uh, and here's something new, I guess. He promised to cut the military budget. Uh, he supported, Carter supported the anti-war movement of the 60s. But if cabinet appointments basically uh, proved he was in the end more of the same, um, and it was reassuring to the business community. Uh, he did support civil rights in South Africa at this time. Uh, the apartheid movement um, was uh, coming to a head, the apartheid. But this was to protect, to, for stability. It wasn't really about human rights. It was about the protecting our business interests in South Africa, in Africa, excuse me. Okay, so the foreign policy of the Carter administration had continuity with the previous Nixon and Ford administration. And what's really, what's really insane about what something he said is that he didn't believe we needed to have send money to reconstruct Vietnam. Uh, you know, after a war, there's reconstruction, you know, civil war. I mean, that's probably what you think of mostly in your mind. But after every war, there's reconstruction aid to build it back up. And that, that has national security implications and a couple, you know, business in, uh, uh, interests and all that. But he said that the destruction was mutual. Let's recall what we read in the Vietnam chapter. We dropped 7 million tons on Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, which was two times the, the amount of bombs a tonnage dropped in World War II. How is that destruction mutual? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so Carter goes along. He supports bad regimes, the Iran, Philippines, Nicaragua, Indonesia, um, he claimed to sympathize with anti-war movement. Again, he didn't really, uh, it was just um, basically a talking point, but he did have a less aggressive foreign policy. So he was, it was designed to leave um, the power and influence of the US military and business. So we now, we're gonna talk about the Panama Canal. So the Panama Canal was an example. So I don't really know, he didn't talk about it too much, so, but in 1903, the United States engineered a revolution against Colombia uh, to establish the Republic of Panama. Now, the Panama Canal was completed around 1915. For example, in San Diego, we had the California Panama Exposition, which was San Diego was supposed to be the first port of entry after Panama. We lost to San Francisco. So the Panama Canal was created in 1915. It was this big, huge deal, uh, like the Suez Canal in, in Egypt. The Panama Canal allowed literally ships to cut um, shipping time in a fraction of the of the cost and the time, which led to uh, 150 million dollars a year in tolls for the United States. So we basically controlled the Panama Canal. It was our 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 we had uh, 14 U.S. bases, um, and only two million dollars went to the Panama government. Uh, as we were, you know, putting $150 million in our pockets, we were giving $2 million to the Panama government. Uh, we also saved $1.5 billion annually in delivery costs. So instead of going all the way around Latin America, if you just cut across, imagine that, how much money you would save. Uh, by 1977, there was anti-American protests in Panama, led to the gradual removal of U.S. bases there. Um, fairly good. Yeah, he covered that well. So at this point in time, so one of the words I use, it's not really used in here, is neocolonialism. 
So I, I colonialism is one of my specialties. Um, and there's new forms of colonialism called neocolonialism, where the structures are in place. Think of systemic racism, something like that. So you have systemic colonialism in from between the relationships between developed countries and non-developed countries or third world and um, first world. Um, I always wonder what second world is, right? <laughs> um, okay, so multinational corporations. So, and so I digress. So one of the forms of neocolonialism, again, that's my word, not Zins, is this idea of multinational corporations. So 98% um, of these multi multinationals were American executives, however, which gives you the idea that you know, who was really, um, who these really were, were about. It wasn't some you know, distant uh, company, it was us. Um, and, and these multinational companies equal the third largest economy after the United States and Russia. Um, and this is where the neocolonialism part comes in. So the investment returns were disproportionately higher in Africa and Latin America. Why? Um, that's for you to answer. Well, maybe I just answered it actually, the, the neocolonialism. But for example, so from 50, 1950 to 1965, these multinational companies invested in Europe, $8 billion, and I'll just round it uh, uh, $5 billion. They made $5.5 uh, billion on their return on investment. That's a 68% return on their investment. So they put in $8 billion and they get back $5.5 .5 billion, uh, which is a 68% return in Europe. However, in Latin America, they put in uh, $4 billion and they get back $11 billion. This is around 300% more. Um, in Africa, these multinational companies invest five, they get packed 14 billion. And again, I'm rounding it. So that's around another, that's almost around another 300% on your return investment. So how come they're getting 68% on their return investment in Europe uh, when they're getting 300% in Africa and Latin America? And that answer is neocolonialism. The structures in place from the colonies are still there, the exploitation. So the U.S. depended on 100% on foreign exports of diamond, coffee, platinum, mercury, national, uh, natural rubber, and cobalt. Basically, these companies are not getting what they deserve. Um, as we're taking their resources, we're getting most of their money. And that's, in essence, what col colonialism is, is a, a stripping of, of all the resources and all that profit goes somewhere else, uh, or most of it. So the U.S. created at this time a, a reputation of generosity, but I would call this an altruistic narcissism. It's not altruism because this aid that we give, obvious, honestly, is for leverage, is to leverage and penalize nations who did not vote in our, in, with us, with the United States at the United Nations. So we use, that, we use that money to basically get what we want, and so we can tell people what to do, how to do it. Uh, most of this aid was military. By 1965, the U.S. exported $9.5 billion in arms, many to oppressive regimes. Uh, and one of the things that Carter did, uh, and that's interesting in this book, is I call him, I call him the Grinch because he stole the milk money from the children. So to save two, $25 million, uh, Carter took away the second milk at lunch. And a lot of people still, their only real meal or full meal is at school. So we have, we live in a, I live in a pretty challenged area here. And uh, during, for example, during the pandemic, a lot of people needed their, that, that was their only meal. So they kept that food going. So to save $25 million, Carter takes away that milk, uh, second milk. Uh, as at the same time, he increases our, his first increase in the military budget is $10 billion. Uh, in five years, he increases the military budget by 1 trillion. Um, all by, you know, so what, so that $25 million is a drop in the bucket, basically. So at this point in time, you have stagflation, prices are rising faster than wages, wages. unemployment higher for young people at 20%, for young black people is at 30%. Um, he ended the regulation on natural gas, and that's one of the common themes throughout this chapter is ending regulation, um, and we'll cover that more. So he, he ended regulation on natural gas. Rockefeller owned one of the largest blocks in private stocks, profit source, 
Um, by the time you get to 2000, Exxon's the wealthiest company in the world. I think it's Apple now. So the maldistribution of wealth in 1977 um, was 1% owned 33% of the wealth or one third and 5%, the 5% the of, of income earners owned 80% of the corporate stocks. And also large corporations were paying 26%. However, oil companies were at 6%. So although they're, they have these percentage, okay, a company pays 26% taxes, when they gets down to it, when they, when they have write-offs, uh, oil companies were paying an average of 6%. And as we know now, a lot of the top corporations don't pay any tax. Well, you and I are paying around 20 ish percent. Um, so we have this maldistribution of wealth uh, coming really, really coming to a catalyst in 77. Tax reform in 77 main, mainly benefited corporations. Carter supported military in El Salvador. So here's kind of his, his laundry list of, Zinn gives us a laundry list of what Carter supported. So Carter supports, uh, there's four of them. Wait, yeah, four. So here's uh, what Zinn talks about. The military in El Salvador. He supported the military in El Salvador. Um, we'll cover this later. Versus the peasant rebellion, peasant rebellion in 80. He supported the president in the Philippines um, versus the opposition and tortured who uh, the president support uh, tortured uh, people. Nicaragua had an unpopular dictator who he supported and in Iran. Um, we'll talk about the hostage crisis later. Um, the hostage crisis happened in 1979 for 14 months. The Iran hostage crisis at the US embassy um, and then at this point in time, that's when our really the anti-Iranian sentiment started it, um, that we have now. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's just kind of um, really not that, um, that part wasn't very, um, he just kind of briefly touches on that. So here's a good part though. So Reagan and Bush's legacy was a conservative one and it was neo non-liberal it was increasing the military budget you'll see that over and over again and more importantly one of the things that reagan did and bush the one of their especially reagan was they really started cutting benefits to the poor they started lowering taxes for the rich this is the bush and Re reagan legacy and they filled the courts with conservative judges so one of the things people don't realize about a presidency, uh, one of the one of the probably the more important legacies, or if not the most important legacy of any presidency, is is their ability to appoint federal judges. For example, Reagan and Bush filled more than half of the eighteen hundred uh, eight hundred and thirty seven federal judgeships, and Reagan and Bush made the Supreme Court right wing. Now that's very important because the Supreme Court is, is for life. And some people think that's a bad idea. I would be one of those. Um, I don't think anyone should have their job for life. Um, I just, I think that's a legacy of maybe history somewhere. So, so the Roe versus Wade um, was the, obviously the right to choose. So in, in the 1970s, the Supreme Court was liberal that's when Roe versus Wade, the abortion um, right to choose, as well as affirmative action. And affirmative action, which my father was a product of because he's Native American, is very, very important and beneficial. Why? Because it makes up for past and present discrimination. UC Davis ruined this in uh, California, uh, which is why I have a huge bone to pick with the UC system. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, you can have yours. So Nixon, um, so Chief Justice Rehnquist would weaken Roe versus Wade, and this is happening currently, actually. Um, and he also stated education is not, uh, this is Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, education is not a fundamental right. The poor should pay. Uh, Clarence Thomas, at this point, was replaced with the very first African-American Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, which is the name of my nephew's school. Um, 
and they replaced so Clarence Thomas was liberal and Thurgood Marshall was conservative, more right wing. And then there's a thing about Anita Hill and her sexual harassment thing here. Um, so th there's so much in this chapter, right? it's hard to not get bogged down. So at this point in time, labor unions were weakened by conservative federal judges. So um, these judges also were pro-business. Unions, uh, and also impor important to mention, unions were weakened by the decline in manufacturing, not just the judges. One of Reagan's first acts was to dismiss the air, air traffic controlling. Um, ah, that's kind of significant, but not really. But what is significant is this. Is so by the time you get to the 80s, you see all these, one of the core um, themes of this book, one of the core themes of this book is labor movements, unionization. And so by the time you get to this era, you're realizing that the 30s and the 40s was the golden age of labor movements. And we're currently now, it's almost like they're non-existent. So Reagan and Bush's lasting legacy again was corporate America became the greatest beneficiary. And they destroyed regulation from Nixon and Carter and others. So for example, Reagan made environmental laws voluntary. Bush weakened the EPA rule, allowing manufacturers to increase hazardous pollutants to uh, 245 tons a year. And currently still, Republicans are the worst for the environment, always have and always will be, hopefully not in the future, but it seems like that's just how it is because they're, they're so pro-business. Uh, so Pope John Paul II talked about the ecological breakdown um, as it's all about greed and selfishness. That's really what this deregulation is. And I would, I would agree with Pope John Paul. Okay, all right, so we covered that. US opposed a cap on carbon emissions proposed by Europe and Japan because we were the worst polluters. Um, and there's a great movie, if you haven't seen it, An Inconvenient Truth in 2006 by Al Gore. Um, so oil at this point in time is king. And Reagan and Bush, and the Bush family is an oil family, by the way, if you didn't know. So they cut research into re renewable energy. Reagan cut 90%. By the 1992, the Brazil Earth Summit suggested to investigate the military because they were one of the worst polluters. So two thirds of ozone killing gases came from the military. The US objected because they were the, um, the, the biggest military at the time. It was basically us that was, they were trying to investigate. Uh, Reagan saved $2 billion for the oil industry, decontrolling oil prices. So 23 oil industry executives redecorated the White House with 270,000. At this point in time, the military is the king and poor are the peasants. So to pay for the military, we made tax cuts to the poor. We terminated social security disability benefits for 350,000 people. We gave tax cuts to the rich of $190 billion. So they always say when they give these tax cuts, it's gonna be good for the economy and it's gonna help, but it never does. It, it, this was like the trickle down effect, which is proven wrong over and over again. So for example, that we just had tax cuts by Donald Trump and it's actually gonna cost us uh, several trillion dollars uh, in the future. So it was supposed to work for us, but these tax cuts to the rich always have an adverse effect. That's why our infrastructure is, is, we have no money for the infrastructure. We used to get it from the rich back in the day when they had these high tax, uh, high tax rates that would pay for our infrastructure. Now, where do we get it from? We do a silly gas tax and it's, it's, it's a tax against the poor or the middle class. So this idea is really um, needs to be fixed in, our, in all of our minds. So at this point in time, unemployment grew uh, to $30 million in 1982, 16 million lost medical insurance often tied to holding a job. Child poverty grew one fourth of the nation's children were, po were poor. One million children lost free school lunch. And now at this point in time, welfare came under attack. So when you use the word assistance to the poor, it's okay. When you say welfare, it's not. 
Um, and it's important to mention who is mostly in this segment. It's, it's minorities, black and brown people. So black children are four times more likely than white children to grow up on welfare. Um, and the cuts gave these folks about 50 to $70 monthly, leaving them below the poverty line, which is $900 a month. Both Democrats and Republicans denounced the welfare program. Um, and they do not mention systemic uh, racism or class barriers. So the tax rate on income. So again, this is really important. This is where most of our money used to come from for our infrastructure, our schools it used to come from the wealthy. Uh, by 1946, this is, you know, some would say one of the better times of America, our schools and our infrastructure. In 1946, 91% of those who had over an income of over 400 grand, $400,000 were taxed at 91%. By 1968, it was 70% if you had over $400,000 of your income, adjusted gross income. 1984, it goes to 50%. 1986, 28%. So again, um, as Carter, Reagan, and Bush are cutting all these, so especially Reagan and Bush are cutting all these programs to the poor, they're giving all their money to the, um, they're, they're giving, um, they're taxing the rich less, excuse me. So from 1978 to 1972, the government lost $70 billion in tax revenue. The poor and middle class now pay more, uh, at this point in time, pay more for social security. And those who make 500,000 or 50,000 contribute the same amount of money. President Carter is to blame for that. The Dems and Republicans are to blame for that. And at this point in time, public opinion starts to turn and they start realizing that the tax system benefits the rich and it's unfair, unfair to the ordinary working man and woman. The gap between the rich and the poor grows during the Reagan administration. In, eight, in 1980s, CEOs of corporations made 40 times more than the average factory worker. By 1989, CEOs of corporations made 93% of the average than the average factory worker. And this goes to show um, uh, and then the next part, he talks about the enduring nature of racism in the Reagan and Bush years. So black families were the hardest hit. Everyone on the bottom is doing worse. By the end of, of the 80s, and here's some socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomics to prove that America perhaps is still a racist country. Uh, one third of black families below the poverty line, two and a half times unemployment um, Blacks were two and a half times more unemployed than whites. Young blacks were 30 to 40 percent uh, more unemployed. And, and uh, their life expectancy was negative 10 uh, when compared to whites. So poverty is perhaps the most important socioeconomic indicator. Why? Because poverty leads to broken homes, family violence, drugs, and crime. And a lot of crime comes from poverty. Uh, for example, 42% of young Blacks uh, between 18 to 35 are in jail, probation, or parole. Uh, and instead of addressing poverty, America starts building more prisons. Segregation remains after Brown versus Board with poverty. And I think a lot of people would make this, you know, it doesn't, it's not a challenge to understand this. Because although we've desegregated our schools, what happens is the rich send their kids to private school or they don't have to send their kids to private school because they live in rich neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods have better funding because they get better taxing, um, they get better property tax and all that. And so their public schools are better. And the poor, they, kind of, they live in poorer neighborhoods, they get less money for their schools, so on and so forth. Char the charter school, the no left behind policy is largely responsible for that, by the way. Um, and I didn't really, um, I didn't see it in here. Uh, in the book, which it probably should be. So um, this American myth of upward mobility that you can get, you know, upward mobility through hard work is persist is what a lot of folks have focused on, why they talk, you know, about welfare and the poor, but it's a myth um, because you don't go to the right, you don't go to the best schools, you go to the worst ones and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a feedback loop uh, over and over again. And the poor, in fact, are blamed for their lot in life. They're blamed that they're lazy. 
they did not work hard enough, et cetera. Um, and so the segregation remained after B B Brown versus Board with poverty. It has kept blacks, this kept blacks in ghettos, the class and race factor. And there's a, an interesting Supreme Court case, San Antonio Independent School versus Rodriguez, where the court stated there's no need for equalization of funds for poor school districts and rich school districts. So what they wanted to do was kind of fix that problem of having, you know, basically poor and rich schools. So they wanted to spread that money around and that was rejected by the Supreme Court. Um, again, Rehnquist said that education is not a fundamental right. So US opposed cap on carbon emissions. Okay, I talked about that. Okay, so now we're talking about the savings and loan crisis. So again, so we talked about deregulation. So the deregulation of savings and loan banks um, led to risky investments. Uh, and then the taxpayers had to pay back this hundred of billions of dollars because it's FDI, FDIC insured. The CIA exaggerated military expenditures and US policymakers stoked fear and invasions of Western Europe. So the CIA lied uh, or exaggerated about the Soviets to build up our nuclear arsenal, our nuclear and non-nuclear arsenal. We had this silly program called Star Wars. It spent billions, it doesn't really do anything. Um, and we so a, a Trident submarine was $1.5 billion, for example. How many submarines do you need and how, many, how much of that money could go for our schools, for our infrastructure, for our social programs? And the reason why it, that doesn't matter is because the military is the pillar of the establishment. Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex and the enormous drain from the treasury um, as a theft from human need. The chickens have come home to roost by the 80s. Both parties support this pillar. And this is ultimately Zinn's thesis is it doesn't matter who's in charge. We have these fundamental things that never change and military is one of them. So Carter proposed again, we talked about earlier, a $10 billion increase. Truman to Reagan to Bush, Congress approved military increases over, over excuse me, overwhelmingly. But it was, something happened in 1989. So the, the Soviets, Basically, the Soviet Union uh, empire crumbled. Okay, so a lot of people don't realize, you know, it's still a debate. Why was it? Was it a lot of people say Reagan did it? Okay, he did it by building up our military. And then the Soviet Union went bankrupt, they overextended themselves, spread themselves too thin. You know, they, they, you know, basically it was, it was us who did it. Uh, then there's other debates. Some, some people say it was Chernobyl. In fact, Chernobyl, there's a really good book about Chernobyl. Um, what is it called? Uh, Voices from Chernobyl. It's a really good book. Um, so but the other thing, so Zinn says something interesting though that I didn't, I didn't really think of. Um, um, actually, and I think we'll, we'll cover that later. But one of the things he says is, um, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, but I already, I already set up the table. One thing he said is that the United States actually prolonged the USSR from crumbling, not created it from happening. So that's an interesting idea. So one of the things that happened in 89 is the Soviet threat disappears. We're the sole power. After World War II, you have the United States and the USSR. Now all of a sudden you just have the United States. And that's an interesting predicament because you have all this, all these guns. You're, you have this budget that's like, been built up, built up, built up, and then now what? So this military budget remained huge with a tiny reduction. The public supported a 50% reduction. This public support went unnoticed or ignored by Washington DC by both the Democrats and the Republicans. In 1992, the Democrats and Republicans voted against the transfer of $120 billion to human need uh, to defend Europe. Okay, so revolution of independence. So Nicaragua. So this this is a really this is kind of the part where I'm like, if this is the first time you read it, you probably don't know anything um, about this. So what happened was um, in 1979, Nicaragua 
we had a revolution of independence. So think of like Vietnam, for example. So this, this movement can be, I mean, I always like to make correlations so I remember stuff. So think of this instance as very similar to Ho Chi Minh where it was a fight for independence. He was Marxist, they were Marxists, the Sandinistas of Nicaragua. Um, and the US, instead of letting them have their independent movement, they supported a corrupt dynasty, the Somoza, the dynasty. And the Sandinistas, like Ho Chi Minh, wanted to give land, more land to the peasants, education and healthcare to the poor. The US saw this as a communist threat and more importantly, the US tradition of control in Central America. Remember the Monroe Doctrine. Um, so the CIA at this point in time waged a secret war to overthrow the Sandinista government using counter-revolutionary counter Contras. So the Contras were based in Honduras, which was a really poor country next door, controlled by the United States. And they committed atrocities against civilians, tortured, mutilated, raped, robbed, or abused. Um, and at this point in time, the American public opposed, so what the, it was remained secret. Um, there was a leak in 84, and Congress had to respond. In response to the public opinion and memory of Vietnam, it made illegal to, uh, for the U.S. to support directly or indirectly para paramilitary or military operations in Nicaragua. Congress, uh, Reagan ignored this. He ignored Congress, and this is this is called the Iran Contra scandal. So, in nineteen eighty, this this broke in the Beirut magazine in nineteen eighty six. It stated, "The U.S. sold Iran." And remember the Iran uh, hostage crisis, right? That was our uh, enemy. It was a big deal uh, in seventy nine uh, with Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, so we sold Iran weapons for hostage uh, for the hostage release in Lebanon. So we had hostages in Lebanon um, and this proceed. So uh, in, let me, let me start over again. So this, this magazine in 1986, the Beirut magazine, we sold weapons to Iranians for the hostage release in Lebanon. And this is Hezbollah. Uh, the proceeds that we, from get selling that weapons selling those weapons, went to the Contras to buy arms to fight in, in the, against the Sandinista um, government. So you have like, it's, that's why this is hard to understand because it's, it's like two conspiracies in one. Uh, and so it, it, this took me a while also. Okay, so that's the gist of the Iran-Contra affair. And more importantly, Reagan lied about, and he ignored Congress um, basically covering up uh, over and over again. Okay, and so the legacy of Contragate, so this is important. There's, there's never any consequences. So Bush was not indicted. Bush later becomes president. Bush was his vice president. Um, Reagan was not indicted. He retired in peace. The lesser culprits were indicted um, and it shielded top officials. So the government violated its own law of pursuing foreign policy goals. And so the question is why, you know, why, why did the government make these, make these laws and treaties if it's just gonna break them? Okay, after Vietnam, so you gotta remember, um, so this is similar to, to, to the Vietnam War when um, the War Powers Act was created. So in 1973, remember when we were waging that secret war in Cambodia? And that was revealed and then Congress had to act in 1973 because uh, the president, this is a quote from Zinn, the president in every possible instance, uh, this is the War Powers Act, excuse me, the president in every possible instance shall, shall consult with Congress before introducing United States armed forces, forces into hostilities. So that was created in 73 as, as a part, part of the Vietnam War when we started war, a secret war in Cambodia. Um, Reagan ignored the War Powers Act uh, a couple other times also. So in Lebanon in 82, we sent 200 plus Marines that, that were bombed and died in Lebanon in 1982. Then in Grenada was uh, where we had 
to control our business interests because there was 118 offshore banks there. Um, and it was also to demonstrate our military might. Uh, Congress was consulted, um, not consulted. Congress was not consulted. They were notified. So it's all just a dress rehearsal. Uh, a lot of these, you know, the War Powers Act didn't really change anything. Uh, okay. So, okay. Hold on a second. Okay, so this is kind of the part of the book where it gets bogged down to me. Uh, I mean, you're probably not going to remember this anyways, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, so the El Salvador thing, um, basically the moral of the story is this. So tyranny is okay if the nation was friendly to the United States. So you have here, um, and I guess it depends where you are, if you if you find this. Um, some people may find this very important. I, you know, I probably should, um, shouldn't have said that. But I'll say, you know, this chapter is so intensely deep. I'm saying it's going to be hard to remember all of this. But anyways, so the military aid that we sent to El Salvador, eventually there was a priest that was murdered. The CIA funded the culprit of this right-wing leader. There was another massacre in 81, mostly children committed by soldiers um, trained by the United States. Okay, yeah, so I take that back. It's, this is probably really important to some people. But I think, you know, when it comes to this chapter, uh, Zen, Zen gets very, um, uh, it's interesting what he, what he sees as, uh, as important to mention and others he doesn't. Um, that's probably what I should have said instead of what I just said. Okay, moving on. So Reagan scoffed at the accounts uh, giving military aid to the Sandinistas. Gaddafi's house was bombed. So, you know, we took Gaddafi out uh, in my very recently. I mean, was that like seven, eight years ago? Or um, yeah, it was pretty recent. But Gaddafi's house was bombed. Um, okay, so here's here's one of the core parts of the chapter. I, you know, if you're going to remember something, remember this. So the dissolution of the Soviet Union was 1988 to 1991. Uh, it took a while, and Reagan is falsely given credit when, in fact, the general effect of the Cold War extremism was to delay rather than hasten the great change that overtook the Soviet Union by the end of the 1980s. Because what you hear in history books, and especially Republicans who love Ronald Reagan, they claim that this hardline policy and increased military expenditures brought down the Soviet Union. Um, it's probably more Chernobyl than, uh, than, the, what, than our policy too. Um, so we paid with 40 years of, an, of enormous and otherwise unnecessary military uh, expenditures. We paid through the cultivation of nuclear weaponry to the point where the vast and useless nuclear arsenal had become and remains today a danger to every environment of the planet. So at this point in time, the Berlin Wall fell, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Hungary get new leadership. So the sudden collapse of the Soviet Union took away the main justification to put bases around the world and spend trillions on the military. Without the Soviet threat, what next? Why not use available money, hundreds of billions on constructive, healthy projects? Hmm, sounds like a good idea. Okay, so what we did is uh, to pr prove um, the gigantic military establishment was necessary. Okay, so basically what Zinn is trying to say that to, to prove that we needed this giant military, we're going to keep using it. This is the core of his thesis. So, for example, Panama's dictator, Noriega, uh, and this is the time of Pablo Escobar and these huge drug trafficking, cocaine and all that, the explosion of it, um, which you'll find like in Narcos and other um, programs. There's been millions of movies made about this. Uh, so Noriega who was, was an ally of the United States, um, basically now it was our chance to take him out. And a lot of it was because of his drug trafficking. And so he was sentenced and captured. We invaded the country. We sent 26,000 troops in 1989. This invasion did not help the country. Uh, and it left 14,000 homes um, destroyed and killed approximately 1,000. The Democrats and Republicans approved military action foreign policy remained bipartisan. So now we get to, to the, so this is um, really kind of the core of the book, the chapter I found. 
that he should have spent more time on. So the Gulf War was only briefly covered. And one of the things I found interesting, and I've studied the Gulf War quite a bit, was that um, you, you have here an opportunity to, to juxtapose Gulf War I and Gulf War II. So Gulf War I was very different than Gulf War II, largely because it was done with much more finesse. Uh, and for example, in Gulf War II, the United States bankrolled it. In Gulf War II, the United States had no consensus. No one wanted to join us. No one really supported us. Uh, we kind of had a British ally you know, or two, another couple allies, but we went at it alone. We paid for it alone. And a lot of our deficit today was started with Gulf War II with George Bush. We had a zero deficit with Bill Clinton, for example. But Gulf War I was bankrolled by the Kuwaitis. We had UN consensus. It was in, in a lot of ways as a statesman go and as a politician goes, you know, if you study political science, Gulf War I was done the right way. It was financed by another country. So there's a lot of things that, you know, when you juxtapose Gulf War I and Gulf War II, there's a lot to say. And Zinn doesn't really say any of that. I don't know if he didn't know it or if it didn't, you know, he just wants to only, you know, and this is where I think Zinn is really biased because he never mentions anything good about any any of these presidents. Um, so I, I actually look at George Bush one as a much one of our better presidents, you know, George Bush two, his son was one of our worst, uh, if not the worst. Um, so you have this, you know, there's an opportunity here and Zinn doesn't take it and he doesn't talk about it. So I just really find that important to mention because I've studied Gulf War one a lot and um, basically, okay. So I got that out of my system. But here's what Zinn says. So the, the Gulf War I was to boost popularity. Uh, the decision was made, uh, boost popularity question mark. The decision was made in October of 90 to invade. Um, he, he named it, it was the infringement of sovereignty uh, against Kuwait. Um, so, so yeah, so one, one of the things Zinn says is this. So the invasion or the infringement of sovereignty is a weak argument. So what what he was what uh, Zinn is saying here is we're 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 um, going to invade Iraq because they're infringing on the Kuwaiti sovereignty. However, when it comes to these other instances, Iran by Iraq, Lebanon by Israel, Mozambique by South Africa, not to mention U.S. invasions of Panama and Grenada, this argument doesn't make any sense because it's inconsistent. So the justification of Iraq was on its way to build a nuclear bomb. This was a very weak justification, but Bush administration was trying to develop paranoia about the bomb that did not exist. U.S. longed for control of the U.S. the Middle Eastern oil resource. Now, I think people understand this more as more now, because um, ever since before, uh, since and before OPEC, the OPEC crisis, we realized that we needed to control Middle Eastern oil as a, um, to stabilize our, econ our economy and our national security because all of our military is, is ran on oil. Um, Saddam didn't think the US would invade. Uh, Bush refused to negotiate. Public opinion was low for military action, less than half. The Senate approves by few votes in 91. Once bombing started, however, both, house over, um, both houses overwhelmingly supported and a lack of support meant you did not support the troops. So we actually have that now, um, right? So the establishment press. So given limited access. So one of the things we learned when I mean we, I mean the gov American government from Vietnam um, that is that you wanna limit the access of the press. You wanna control them. Oh, hey, just, you know, you, you got this one corner. You don't want them to go to the My Lai massacre. Remember that? Or these other things uh, where you where they just go and out into the field. So by the time you get to the to Gulf War One, you have the the press being part of the establishment, as Zinn would say. You have this idea of smart bombs, saying that we're not bombing civilians when in fact uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of civilians were killed and injured. The press behaved like it was working for the government. And it also gave the false impression Saddam was a formidable foe when air and ground assaults encountered little to no resistance. 
Unfortunately, the legacy of the Gulf War left tens of thousands of children dead from starvation and disease. Uh, 55,000 of excess child deaths were reported. Uh, Saddam depicted as Hitler, but left in power, why? And this is where um, I tell people it's the balance of power strategy. So um, it was to weaken, but not remove, because you would leave a power vacuum. And we did not support the Kurds afterwards, even though they helped us. The Kurds were gassed in 1988 in the Halabja chemical attack. I did not support other anti-Saddam factions either. Um, and so Bush declared, so, and this is really important to understand. Um, I think this is that, this will be the final note, final thing I say. So the most important thing is consistency. So when you're studying history, when you're learning, if you understand how things connect can consistently, you remember more. So one of the things Bush said at the end was he declared the specter of Vietnam has been buried in the desert sands of the Arabian Peninsula, has been buried forever in the desert sands of the Arabian Peninsula. The New York Times agreed the establishment press. America's victory in the Persian Gulf War provided special vindication for the US Army, which brilliantly exploited its firepower and, and mobility. And in the process, erased memories of its grievance, grievous difficulties in Vietnam. The Democratic Party was pleased with the results and anti-Arab Muslim sentiment uh, rises uh, and racism ri rise about the anti-Muslim racism. All right, everyone, that was really hard for me. Um, it took me many, many hours. This is the hardest chapter uh, so far. I thought it was the New Deal one, but I think the, this is the most important chapter and this will lead up to his ultimate thesis in chapter 23, which is the coming revolt of the guards. So if you understood this chapter, you're ready for the final finale, the coming revolt of the guards. So there's gonna be one chapter after this, and then the other, the last chapter is really what this whole book is about. And it really, uh, you can see why Zinn is like how he writes and why he writes uh, and in a very biased way, because he's trying to prove his thesis this thesis of the establishment and this consensus on both sides. And uh, anyways, so thank you for watching. I hope you appreciate and, and like this video and I will see you in a bit. Take care.